Uh, please turn to Psalm 73. Uh, that's where we're going to be today. It's uh, 28 verses. I'm going to read through that. We'll pray and then we'll get started in our text. Psalm 73. Truly, God is good to Israel. To such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning an oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I've cleansed my heart in vain and, and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. And if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are a good God. And as I said earlier, we will not let anyone say you are not. We will not let Satan or his demons try to trick us into thinking you are not a good God and also a good God that is in control. Jesus, much of what we've just read is only possible because of what you have done on the cross for us. Jesus, be with me as I preach your word this morning. Let's call this in Jesus name. Amen. All right. As we look through the word of God, there are um, many themes that you find throughout the scripture. But one that is mentioned very often, often is the practice of remembrance. We're told consistently through scripture, remember your God, uh, remember his works, remember the gospel story. Uh, here's some verses for you. Deuteronomy 612. Way back in the beginning of the Bible, Deuteronomy 612 says this, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. When we get to Ecclesiastes 12, one, he says, um, Solomon says this, remember also your creator. And the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Psalm 103, two says this, bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all his benefits. And then when we get to the second Timothy two, eight, 
Paul says to uh, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. So you have to ask yourself, why so many warnings to remember for God's people? And if you're asking that question, well, here's the answer. Life is short and it's hard. Just by itself, life is short and it's hard. Life is a vapor. But on top of that, we have an enemy that wages war uh, against us. And his main attack is in our minds. Uh, Second Corinthians 4, 4 says this. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So before we were called and our eyes are open to the glory of Jesus, we were blinded by Satan. So that's what's that's what's going on with everyone that's not saved. But Satan doesn't stop when we actually come to know the Lord either. He knows he can't blind us anymore to the glorious light of Jesus, but he still tries to dim that light. This is why it's important for us to remember consistently reminded to take hold of our mind. Romans 12, 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Philippians 2, 5, have the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Why? Because daily our mind is playing tricks on us. And I'm not talking about optical illusions, more darker and sinister than that. Like in the garden, Satan is, is still selling this lie that caused Adam and Eve to fall. And that is that God is not a good God. That is the song of Satan's heart. That is the song that he loves to sing. He's going to sing that song until he is thrown into the lake of fire forever. Satan loves that song. And one thing about music and songs is if you listen to an artist or a song long enough, it starts to shape you. So today we hear from the psalmist ASAP and his story about how he was almost, how he almost walked away from God. What I love about this psalm is actually who is writing it um, is what I love about it. Uh, so King David, who was a man after God's own heart, appointed Asap to be his song leader. Uh, Asap was appointed to give praise to the Lord in the temple. Now, if King David, who was close to God, said to Asap, hey, I need you to to lead music. I think we can say Asap was a mature spiritual man of God. Can we, can we agree with that and say that he was a, a mature spiritual man of God, that David, who knew the Lord, decided, hey, this guy is the guy I want on my team to lead music and things of that nature. So he led music. He was a choir leader. He played the harps. Uh, he was a drummer. So I already like this dude already. Um, that's my thing. You know, I love the drums. He likes to bang the cymbals a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm immediately drawn to this guy. And here's what's great about this psalm being written by, written by a spiritual, uh, holy leader. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, how holy you are, or how long you've been walking with God. Your emotions and your affections must be guarded daily by truth of God's word. And remembrance of the work of Jesus Christ and the promises of Jesus Christ, because Satan hates God and wants to turn you from God. Listen to Asap speak. He says, truly, God is good to Israel, to such who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Now, you need to read that to the right way. He's not just saying truly God is good to Israel. He's saying truly God is good to Israel. And let me tell you what just happened to me. That is what he is saying. He's about to reflect on what almost happened to himself. So truly, God is good to Israel. Let me tell you what I just went through. There was a time when he was really wrestling with whether or not God is really a good God. Um, this brother said, I almost stumbled. I almost slipped. He's saying my affections and my emotions, they almost had me. 
And I'm sure we've all had those emotions, um, w- those moments when our emotions made us believe something that later came out not to be true, or our emotions have um, had us at a place where I'm done, I'm just done. And maybe that's how you feel here today. So what had Asaph about to slip? Well, he tells us, verse three, for I was envious of the boastful, some of your Bibles may say arrogant, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, is he alone and thinking like this? I mean, raise your hand. Have any of you ever in your walk wondered, is it really worth to follow God when you look at what you have and what others have? Has anyone? If, if you can't be honest at church, by the way, you can't be honest anyway. I'm just telling you that right now. Like, you got to be honest. I promise I won't tell on you. You, you can be promised. So thank you for being honest. Um, have you have you compared your life with others and come to a place of anger and envy at God? Whenever the lottery drawings get really high and and uh, everyone is talking about it, I always am reminded of so many stories. I've uh, I've heard of people winning the lottery and losing their families and losing uh, their money and destroying their lives. And then I'm also reminded of how rich I am in Christ. And I have to remind myself of that or I'll start to covet. I'm reminded that Jesus gave a parable in Luke 12 of a rich man who had his riches all planned out. And God said, you fool. Today, I'm taking your life. And you are going to eternal punishment. Jesus says in Luke 12, this is the future of everyone who isn't rich towards God. So in the midst of this fallen reality where God's people have to remember True, true reality, um, it could be difficult. But have you ever felt God could do better with your life? Now, I know that sounds crazy, right? When I just said that out loud, that sounds crazy. But how many of us have had that thought or are thinking that the God of the universe is mishandling your life? So there's a question. Is it worth to follow God? And it kind of runs throughout uh, this text. So what I want us to do is to count this, count the cost this morning. And and let's wrestle with those emotions as Asaph has done as well. As he looks at, he looks at their present, his present life. And then he looks at the future life of believers. And he kind of wrestles with, is it worth to follow God? So let's start with Psalms 4 through 12. Asaph makes a list of what he sees with his eyes dealing with the lifestyle of the wicked. And from his examination, and maybe yours as well, yours as well, it seems the wicked have it pretty good and God's people don't. And in that, Asaph is saying to God, God, you have some explaining to do. <laughs> and clearly he's been thinking about this a lot because he literally made a list. He says, starting this list, verse four, um, the wicked have no pangs in their death. What he's saying is the wicked have no pain throughout life, just joy until they are on their deathbed. This is the way he sees it. And doesn't it seem like that sometimes, though? Some people have no God and then they also seem to have really no issues. And your life is just a horror movie that no one's made a movie about yet. Right. (laughs) Right. That's how I feel sometimes. He says their strength is firm. Some of your Bibles may say bodies are fat and sleek, so they look good. Uh, Models, athletes, um, they don't have to work out. They just wear workout clothes all day, but don't work out. Uh, Maybe financially able to fix things about themselves they don't like. Uh, Not wanting for food, but having the best food when they want. Um, Or if not the best food, never wondering if they have enough food for groceries after paying their bills. Verse five, it says, uh, they're not as troubled as others, not stricken like the rest of mankind. This is the one that would get me from time to time. Um, Doesn't it seem like for some people that do not follow God, real punishment for sins and crimes never happen, right? Doesn't it seem that some people have like this special protection from God as they sin against God? 
did we not just watch a man slap another man on national TV and just went about his day? I'm talking about Will Smith. If that was me, they would have put me under the jail. <laughs> right? If y'all wanted to see me, you would have to start a prison ministry to see me. I would be in jail, locked up immediately. But he just went right back to his seat and is just living his life. They're not plagued or stricken like the rest of mankind. As a believer, it seems like we go from valley to valley while others only know mountaintops. Verse six, pride is their necklace. You try your best to be humble like your savior, Jesus Christ. Remembered you are a, remembering you are a created being and others wake up and dress themselves with pride. And they roll over people like there's like they're nothing and they they get promotions and they get cheers. They write books on how to get what you want. And at work, work can be a very lonely place, can it not? You work so hard at your job and, and still just be so unnoticed. So unseen. Verse six, violence covers them as a garment. So pride is their necklace and violence is a garment. So this is a this is an outfit that many pull out the closet when they wake up. Many wake up and choose violence. It is the way of their life. As God's people are commanded to turn the other cheek and to and to be forgiven. Many just wake up and say, if anyone does anything to me that I don't like, I am going to hurt them. And that's the way they live their life. Here's another one you may be able to relate really well with. Verse seven, their eyes bulge with abundance. Your Bible, some of your Bibles may say they swell out with fatness. Proverbs 27, 20 tells us that the eyes of man are never satisfied. And in Philippians 3, 12 through 21, where Paul writes about people headed destruction, he says their, their God is their stomach. Their glory is the same. Their, their mind is set on earthly things. They, they get what they want and then they want more. And you would just be happy with half of what they had. They are never satisfied and they never seek God. Their happiness is only what matters, and it seems that God blesses them with what they seek. Yet for you, child of God, it seems God says yes sometimes and no most of the times to your prayers. Verse 7, more than the heart could wish, hearts overflow with folly, some of your Bibles may say. So the imagination of the hearts of the wicked run riot. Um, all they think about is sin daily and how to accomplish their sins. Verse 8. They scoff and speak wickedly with malice. You try to speak with respect and gentleness, as we're told to do in the book of Peter. But the wicked, they say what they want. They post what they want. And they're celebrated, especially women today. Um, I saw a woman who had posted on Twitter. Um, and I've, I've never been a fan of Facebook because it can, it can become an echo chamber. And so can Twitter if you let it. Uh, but Twitter has been a real great way for me to really look at the pulse of our generation. But I saw a woman on Twitter. She said, um, um, long gone are the meek and lowly women of the Bible. And then she goes on to say how she is released from the chains of godliness and being a good wife. And I was like, man, is your husband reading this? And then she said, <laughs> and, and then she said I'd be kind of worried about that a little bit. Uh, but uh, anyway, and then she says, and people and people celebrated that. And then I saw another woman on Twitter, Christian wife, berated daily, says she's old fashioned. All she said was she loves being a wife and a mother and seeking Jesus. Verse eight, they threaten oppression. The Bible has a lot to say about uh, oppression, but to sum it up, he hates it. How many people are getting rich off of the oppression of others? And they're getting and they keep getting richer. Or there are people who use their power to silence others. That's just this is how they work. Oppression. Verse nine. They set their mouths against the heavens. They cuss and slander God. They diss him in songs. They they try to change just words. They think his law or his rules, if they may, are dumb. They ask, where is this God? You claim he is coming back. And yet God lets them live. They continue to prosper, it seems. They look at life and say, I have more than you. Why are you following God? You should be following me. Verse nine, tongues struts through the earth. Asaph says the wicked altogether say with their tongues, I am God in my own word, in my own world. Excuse me. Verse 10. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by him. So 
Asaph is starting to, to um, really to transition in this text. And he's saying God's people hear the mocking and the pride and the slander. And we start to become dismayed and we start to believe what we hear. And we start drinking in all those words. We start to believe the song about God. We hear everywhere, every single day, in every movie, in every commercial. It starts to get to us. This is what I meant about Satan's song that he sings. Like all music, when you listen to it for a long time, it starts to shape you. Verse 11, is there knowledge in the most high? Does God not know what's going on down here? Verse 12, the wicked are always at ease, always increasing in riches. Then look at verse 13. He says, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. He's like living this life of of following you, is it in vain? The, the worship leader is saying this, by the way. You want to keep putting back to that. This is a man who knows God. And that's why I love the word of God. Because it doesn't leave stuff out of it like this. Because these are real emotions that we deal with and that we will have to wrestle with. Verse 14. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. Asaph is saying, basically, in vain, I am following God. Where am I going? What profit is it to follow the creator of the universe if all I know is pain and suffering? So Asaph, he, he almost slipped and stumbled away from God. But what stopped him? He tells us in verse 16 through 17. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. So what happened? ASAP went to church. ASAP may have entered the sanctuary and maybe he saw a picture of something that reminded him of what's really going on in the world. Uh, maybe a priest or, or, or someone was reading from the book of Exodus about how God conquered the false gods and rescued his people from Egypt. And that started to resonate with him. Maybe the priest was reading about Solomon and Gomorrah and their end because of their wicked sin. Maybe ASAP ran into some brothers and sisters and was reminded of who God is and what he is doing and, and what is to come. Maybe it was the songs, songs that sang about God and his goodness and his uh, Messiah who is coming and his kingdom. This is why singing songs that are filled with the word of God, songs that are about God and not us is so crucial to helping us through this life. This is why the word being preached from the pulpit is so crucial because many aren't doing that anymore. They're giving talks, motivational speeches about being a better you when you need the power of God in this life and who he is and his strength. When you really when what you really need is truth to keep you from falling, uh, to change your fallen perception of life. To the truth that Jesus has has rescued me from the kingdom of darkness and and transferred us into the kingdom of his son. That's Colossians one verses 13 through 14. This is this is why taking time on Sundays to talk to each other is is so important or texting throughout the week is so crucial because many come through those doors on Sunday like ASAP ready to they're slipping. Pain and grief, they're, they're, they're feeling slighted by God. Why it's so important for us to take time to get past the how's the weather? Oh, the weather's great to really see what people are going through. And ASAP was able to discern the end once he went to the sanctuary. I love that. What did he discern? Well, let's look at it. Well, his eyes were playing tricks on him and now he sees what's going on. Verses 18 through 20 say this. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. I have a friend, a dear friend, a friend who I love that every winter, except this last one so far, um, they had they had a they usually have great falls during the winter. They, they slip on ice. Great falls, really big falls. Uh, it was guaranteed like it's guaranteed every winter uh, this would happen and I would be there to see it. Um, one time this person was walking to my car 
and um, they start to slip. You know the slip dance that you're about to do when you're about to fall on ice, right? And uh, I was like, oh, here we go. So I get the popcorn, like, here it go. It's about to, <laughs> it's about to <laughs> sorry. And um, uh, um, they, they didn't fall. I was like, look at that. They didn't fall. And then they took one more step, and then they, whoo, boom. And I made sure they were OK before I started laughing at them, because um, I'm not heartless. But listen, that, that's a perfect picture of this. Satan is the deceiver. Many are on slippery slopes and they just haven't fallen yet, but it's guaranteed they're going to fall. He wants you to believe that God is holding out on you, Satan, like he said to Adam and Eve in the garden. And he, he likes to manipulate our understanding of life. But here's the truth. The wicked have been set up in slippery places and those who are slipping will eventually fall. The wicked are guaranteed a great fall. Look at verse 27. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who's unfaithful to you. You see, Asap was wrong about two things here. He is wrong about how he views the, the life of the wicked. And he is wrong about how he believes God deals with us, his people. His emotions and affections have blinded him to what's really going on. And I must say, there's a lot of that going on today in many of our churches. Many of God's people are looking outside of God's world to fix our culture. And the fact is, the problem is the same problem that's always been. It's always been sin. It's always been disobedience to God, idolatry. The problem is there is a good God who desires for people to be saved, who redeems us with the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. And when God saves us, he allows us to be a part of his family. And, and many reject him, forgetting that when we, 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 are, when we say we are saved, when Christians say they are saved, we are, sa we are saying we are saved from the wrath of God. Now, now here's what I here's what I mean. Now, many of you, I know you've, you've had to hear this argument by now, possibly at work when you witness or just talking where people say, I don't need Jesus to be a better person. I just need my crystals. My horoscope. I just need to be nice. You fool. You are a fool if you believe that. We don't get saved to be better people. We're saved from the wrath of God. Does, does, am I, are you understanding what I'm saying? There is a, a God who hates sin. Who sent his son to die for sin. You reject that. The wrath of God is still upon you. We didn't come to Jesus just to, so we can learn how to be better people. No. The wrath of God, God will judge sin. Through the spirit of God, we don't become better people. We become like Jesus. There are two types of people on earth. You are either in Christ or you are still in Adam. You either agree with God that you are a sinner and you accept the salvation that God provides that came through his, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Or you believe you are your own God and you have no need for God. Which is what, that's what we saw in the garden. If you choose the latter, here is your end. Verse 19. Oh, how they are brought to a desolation as in a moment. Don't some people, people just die, right? They just here one day and, and gone. If you are here today or listening to this and you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, what this text is saying is that like God's people, you too will die. The life you are living that brings you so much joy and freedom will one day come to an end. Like everyone who has ever lived, everyone will have to answer to God. Jesus died for the sins of others, died for the disobedience towards God. He was sinless, but he, he steps into our place, takes our, takes our wrath. So sin in his fullness will be dealt with forever. Amen to that. And that includes anyone who chose this life over God, though. So when we say God is going to deal with sin, we're talking about also people. 
You can't buy your way out of this. You can't use your great personality this time. Your prophecy rocks won't save you. Your good works will not work. Your family member who walks with the Lord will not be able to save you this time. You will be sentenced to eternal death in a place called hell with Satan and his demons. The one who convinced you that your life was better off without God. That you should reject Jesus and go your own way. Unless you make Jesus your Lord and Savior through faith. Christians, this is why Asaph says, look at verse 21. If you're a Christian, look at verse 21. He says, when my soul was embittered, soured, grieved, I was vexed in my mind. Some of your Bibles may say, when I was pricked in my heart, vexed in my mind. And then verse 22 says, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Asaph is saying, believer, when you think that the wicked have a better life than you do with all the promises that we have from Jesus Christ and all the promises that have been fulfilled and the promise that he is coming for us, we are being ignorant like beasts when we think like that. I love what Spurgeon says here. He says, a lack of understanding upon doctrinal truth, providential dealing or inward experience has often caused the people of God a vast amount of perplexity and sorrow, much of which they might have avoided had they had been careful to consider and understand the ways of the Lord. And then he gives this beautiful illustration. He says, when people saw the ox, he's, he's talking about sacrifices. When people saw the ox that they would parade through the streets covered with garlands, no one ever envied the ox when they remembered the ox was added, was headed to the ax and the altar. Does that make sense? No, 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 no one's saying, look at that beautiful ox. I wish I was that ox. Everyone's worshiping the ox. Everyone's celebrating the ox because everyone knew the ox was going to be dinner for later. This is the same thing that we do when we covet those who do not know God. We're like beasts. We shouldn't envy the wicked. We shouldn't pity. Uh, we should pity the wicked. Uh, it should motivate us to pray for them. To say like Jesus said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Also, it's foolish to envy the wicked. This is huge. Please get this. It's, it's foolish to envy the wicked because God doesn't always punish the wicked with sickness or death. But sometimes God punishes the wicked on earth with their own wishes. Sometimes God says, your punishment is this. I'm going to give you all of your desires and it will destroy you. And here we are coveting the raft on someone's life. It's insane. Here we are wishing we could be like that person when we're literally witnessing God's wrath on their life. It's satanic because it's from Satan, Satan, the great deceiver. So I said there are two things. We're almost done. ASAP is wrong about here. We talked about the first, the second. Well, first, those who do not know God are not always in peace. Those who do not know God are not always in peace. So what so what ASAP has been wrong about, he's wrong about uh, how he views people. And he's also wrong about how God deals with us. And so here it is. Those who do not know God are not always at peace. They live in fear of losing their riches all the time. They live in fear of man's approval, sleepless nights due to their own sin that they, they hope no one finds out. Um, many live minute by minute, minute in despair and anxiety, only smiling to post a, a fake picture on social media, pretending they are happy. We as people need a time of lament. Everything is not OK, and that's all right. One of the joys of being in Christ is that you can stop pretending to have it all together and be weak because ASAP says in verse three, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever, which leads to the future 
of God's people. Psalm 73, 23 through 28. Notice the wicked in the text. They practice pride, injustice, violence, envy, greed, blasphemy, laziness, um, and a lack of compassion. All of the things that God's people are supposed to, uh, uh, be, to stay away from. Um, God rescued us from those things. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So unlike the wicked, we will be with God. But also remember that, thou, that God sits high in the heavens. He, he, became, he, he became low and came to walk with us and to live inside of us uh, to the point that Jesus also says to us in Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The wicked cannot say that. Asaph says in 23 through 24 that God holds my right hand and he guides me. That's pointing to Jesus. Matthew 6, 25 says this. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither soar nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, because the kingdom of God will stand forever as the world burns away along with this, uh, these materials and wickedness and the wicked. Asaph has come to his senses and he says in verse 25, whom have I have in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Asaph is saying, listen, yes, life is hard. But unlike the wicked, the creator God is for me and is with me through his life, guiding me and giving me counsel. We learn from the book of Hebrews that we have a father who loves us like a father enough to punish us even when we are disobedient. That's how close he is walking with us and keeping us and guiding us. That he punishes those who he loves, removing idols out of their life. We have a God who will not take his hands off of us. Jesus tells us that there will be trials and we'll be hated because the world hated him. But fret not. He says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That's where that where I am. You may be also. The wicked better enjoy life now. Because those who see Jesus as unworthy to be praised and followed will slip and slide into hell. And God's people will be carried into glory with Jesus to live forever. This should, this should encourage us, but it should also motivate us to spread the word about the coming Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, we should be encouraged, yes, because life can seem unfair, but uh, we have all of these blessings. Um, Ephesians 1, go read that later on today. Ephesians 1 starts off with all these blessings that we have. You Blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We have so many blessings. We are rich in Christ. Christian, can you say with ASAP, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Who can say that? Maybe you can't. Maybe you can't say that. Let's end looking at some of these scriptures to help us. Um, when Satan has like a grip on my emotions and my affections and everything starts to seem just so foggy. Here's some verses I like to go to. Psalm 90, 12 through 15. It says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that you may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. And this is fulfilled in Jesus. We are promised eternal life when there is no more pain, there's no more suffering, there's no more injustice. Look at Psalm 34, 18 through 19. I'll read it for you. It says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions, afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Did you hear that? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, 
but the Lord delivers him out of them all. That is pointing to Jesus as well. Jesus will deliver us from this world of sin, this fallen world. And he, and when, we, when you're saved, he walks with us and he carries us through this life, protecting us even when we don't even know it. We are intruders on this earth. When you become a Christian, you're an alien and an enemy of the world. So Jesus, he, 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 he promises us up front, listen, this is, you're going to be persecuted. And yet, God promises to do life with you, especially when you're crushed in spirit, especially when you're crushed in spirit. Jesus says, bring your tears to me. And also remember, things are never as bad as you think they are. The spirit, uh, according to Thessalonians, is keeping mankind from being as evil as it wants to be. The last one would be verse I, I, I really like to go to is Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Do you hear what the God said? The God who sits in heaven, who sits high in heaven, also draws near you and walks with you. That is what our God says to us. Christian, if you came in here with a heart that was failing, because of your circumstances, you need to feast on these verses today and for the rest of your life. You need to understand that you are being manipulated by an enemy who's a master manipulator to tell you your God isn't good, to cause you to covet. Um, he is a defeated foe. Verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. May we be a people who see clearly the works of the devil. May we be a people who see clearly our God who loves us and has sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us, to draw us into his family. May we see clearly the real reality, the scripture and the gospel paints for us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as I talk to your sons and daughters here, um, I thank you that because of your wisdom and your knowledge, you see that we have an enemy that though he may not be able to blind us because our eyes have been opened to your goodness and we are Christians and we are or your children and you've called us into your kingdom. He tries to dim that light by still trying to make us seem make you seem like you are not a good God. And so for your people here who know you, who have trusted in you, who have placed their faith in your son, who are walking with you, Lord, please protect us from the evil one. Lord, give us, remind us of our story. Remind us the, of the gospel story. Um, that in the garden where we failed, where, where Adam and Eve sinned against you and your word, you made things right. You promised us a savior that would crush the head of the serpent. But you also tell us in the Genesis story that we're going to be living in a fallen world, a world that's going to be harder because of our sins and our disobedience towards you. And you send us Jesus who worked, who, who lived the perfect life, who was obedient to you, who saw things as they were, who was about his father's business, who was rich towards God who did nothing wrong and was nailed to a cross for our sins, who rose three days later, justifying, signifying that payment for sin had been accomplished and promised to return us. God, remind us of the gospel story that we should not cover the wicked. We should have mercy. We should have compassion for them. We should see people as they are lost 
We should see the world as broken and lost and in need of your redeeming grace. We should not try to fix the world um, through man's ways, but we should try to fix the world by the tools you've given us, which is the gospel, which is your word and, your, and the promise of your spirit to go before us and to be with us. If, if there are any Christians here who are struggling with this, make, reach out to your brothers and sisters. God also gave us the church, the body of Christ, to stand in the gap when you probably can't even pray. You're just at a bad place right now. You have brothers and sisters that want to hear at this church that want to pray for you. They want to take you aside and encourage you in the hope that we have in Jesus. For those here who do not have a relationship with the Lord, who are trying to live life um, in the direction that they would have it. That may look different for many, but it ends in one, in one place, standing before a holy and righteous God who you have sinned against. You are, don't take it for granted that you're here this morning and that you're hearing these words said, God is speaking to you and saying, repent, repent, because I have given my son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins of disobedience, of idolatry, of breaking God's commandments. And yet, he's a good and great God, holy, but also shows mercy and grace and gives opportunities for us to repent and to turn from our wicked ways and to turn to him. And not by works, but by faith by placing your faith in Jesus, that he is the son of God, that he died for your sins, that he is the Messiah that rose three days later, the resurrection, that he is uh, the son of God who was seen by over 500, who, who went, ascended into the heaven and is one day returning, sitting at the right hand of the father, mediating for us. That if you would place your trust in Jesus Christ. We are promised that he would come. His spirit will come into your life. Your eyes will be open to what's really going on. The word of God opens our eyes and you will start to see the reality that we live in and you will see the end, but you will also be encouraged by the opportunities that has been given to us to escape the raft of God. If you'd like to talk about this further, Please come see me after. Um, there are many here as well who have accepted Christ's salvation and, and his um, salvation that he's provided for us. They have stories too they could tell you as well. But, but a smart person would not leave here without looking further into these things. A smart person, a wise person would look into the things that I have said on this stage. Would not just walk out of here and say, oh, it's just another day. But if I was told that if I don't change my life, the wrath of God is upon me. And I, when I die, there is, a, there, is a, there is a God I have to answer to. I would, a wise person would look into those things. So I'm asking you to stay and talk with us, to, to, to hear more about the gospel, to accept salvation. But, but if you do not accept, stay and talk. We, I want to talk with you. I'll be, down, I'll be in the back and I'll be downstairs. A wise person would do that before they walked out of this door. Father, we thank you for your word. May it continue to guide us and be with us and encourage us as we sing this great song about our hope that we have in you, that we see in scripture that you promise us that you will return from us. We can stand on that hope because you are a solid rock, Jesus. Father, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.